talk about a bit more about mental health problems. I wanted to start by talking about your mother, your mother, your memories of your mother, and her attitude towards stress and passion. And I wonder if you could tell us what your first memory of your mother is in relationship to clothes. Well, the first living memory, if you like, that I had was when I was really quite tiny uh, in the cutting room, which was off the, the main uh, work rooms and where the clothes were all put together and then the fitting rooms and various other things. But I used to crawl around on the floor at the age of about four with a magnet picking up dropped pins uh, while people above me were sewing and carrying on and doing everything else. It was a way of keeping me entertained while the rest of the world went on making fashion. So that's, I suppose that was, I was about three or four. That, that's the first clear memory of the shops and the, the shop and all the things that were going on around it. I mean, it, it, was, it was a madhouse and it was quite fascinating. And were you, so you were aware really from the start of your life as your mother being a fashion designer being dress designer, that's very much linked. Yes, I mean, it, it, I mean, fashion designer and dress designer, uh, she ran a business when I was little, which was about making clothes. And it was, uh, you know, it was an amazing place to go to because it was very contrasted. The, the, one of the showrooms was in an old mansion block and the main showroom for the costumes was in a ballroom. And then behind the ballroom, uh, there were living quarters, and then upstairs there was a whole workroom, uh, a vast space with probably seven or eight or ten people working at everything, with dummies and models and fitting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I didn't tie it up as high fashion until you know quite a lot later when I was uh, in high school, but. It was, it was there, that was what, what, what went on on my, on my, excuse me, my mother's what life. And uh, that's what I was attached to and around when I was young. And was this um, the, the salon that was on 59th Street, I think? Or? I can't, I guess there was one in 59th Street uh, and Madison. Uh, and there was another one further down. Originally, before I came into the scene, it was called Hawes Harden. And uh, because Harden's family were rich enough to actually float the business in the first place. And she did it as a dilettante uh, and got bored and finally just left. But by then, the business was functioning well enough so that uh, it wasn't necessary to capitalize it. And they, they went on. But, it was, that was done as a dilettante. Lizzie was really fascinated by uh, clothes and how they worked and how they worked on bodies and how they did uh, what you could do to change people to their attitude and the influence of art and artists on uh, what was, you know, uh, style as opposed to fashion. And, and so did that, did that extend to the salon where she presented the clothes? How was that different? Sorry, Rebecca. In the salon where she presented the clothes, um, you described the sort of different rooms in her establishment. Can you remember how they were decorated? Because thinking about, did she use the same sort of ideas in the interiors that she did in her clothes? Well, yes, the, 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 the receiving rooms, if you like, which were the, the several fitting rooms. Uh, were all uh, painted in her and done up in, her, in a particular style. She had this curious thing of wishing and using different colors for different walls and different tones of colors uh, in both at home and also in, in, in the receiving rooms. I mean, the work rooms were white, were clean, were utilitarian. But the main room, had, the main uh, showroom where the models worked, uh, we're all done out with palm trees and all sorts of that. And then she would do terrible things to people. She had a skunk that had its scent removed. And she used to take, like the models, walk the skunk through with the clothes, like a dog. And this caused havoc among the, the population until they realized that it was a, just a, you know, it was a de-skunked skunk. But the poor animal was nocturnal. 
So if there was a show in the mid-morning, he didn't want to get up and go to work. <laughs> so he'd go like this and just become comatose in the middle of the, of the thing. So that's, you know, but I mean, her clothes were, she, in a way it was a statement of herself because uh, the, she was very iconoclastic about, about the rigidity of society and the way it was going together. And she liked people, she felt people should look stylish and, and beautiful, and she felt that style, as removed from fashion, was something that was enduring. And what's interesting about that is that her clothes have been copied and recopied and studied since they were put into uh, collections uh, in the late 50s. And people like Calvin Klein and Donna Karen have been to look at what she did for ideas. So I mean, it's obviously it's there. Yes, I mean she's certainly she's certainly very important to an idea of, as you say, a sort of different kind of clothing, which is looking at how people actually live and how they move and how they feel in their clothes. Um, did she extend? That? Did she make her own clothes? Did she make your clothes? Well, originally, she, when she started, she made her own clothes, and she made her clothes. My grandmother used to, or my great-grandmother used to bring a seamstress from New York. They lived outside New York in New Jersey after my great-grandfather uh, died, and the seamstress used to be brought in from New York and make clothes for the entire family for the year. And Lizzie was so fascinated, she started doing it herself. And at 12, she was actually making clothes to sell to shops as a sort of sideline to make money and to, to actually enjoy doing it. And what she did was extremely odd. She made her clothes, but her collection, one set of her collections were always made to her size. So that in the end, she ended up with a collection. So are you saying she would make, she would make the samples for the models and then the samples? That's, she would make, the samples for the models to wear to show, all the models were very petite, as my mother was, and so that at the end of the day, she had a complete collection of her own clothes made, which uh, she just took over, the ones that she wanted at the end of the season. Oh, interesting. <laughs> That's so interesting. And did she keep all of them? Uh, well, she kept some of them. She gave her sister a great number of them, which her, Charlotte then subsequently gave to various collections. They're there. And she gave some, and uh, she kept most of them, but most of them fell apart because in, her life is rather interesting because it was absolutely fascinating and full steam ahead until about 47. Uh, and at which point the business came unraveled, and it came unraveled for various reasons. Uh, one notably that because of her left wing background, uh, the FBI wanted to uh, sabotage her and told her clients that she was a dangerous left winger, and her clients drifted away. So there was no work, which is... So this was after she'd worked in Detroit and she came back? to New York in about 48, 47, 48? Yeah, in about that. She set up the second business at the end of 47, I believe. I'm not sure of the dates. But it then fell apart quite rapidly, and within the next two years, it was gone. You see, in 41, uh, she was at the height of her trade, but she actually decided that it wasn't right that people should be making high fashion clothes for enormous sums of money. Uh, when there was a war on. And the, her last piece that's really memorable, and I gather it's being restored, is a wedding dress that she made. And she was asked to make a silk wedding dress in 1940 when there was no silk available. So she went to Stanford's, the, the flag people, and bought all the silk flags that were left in the shop, the whole lot, and made a, a wedding dress which is completely made of silk flags. And on the bottom, she put the access flags so that the bride sat on the access every time. And then she closed the shop, and she went to work for 
write aeronautics in New Jersey, near where my grandmother's house was, to learn how to be a precision grinder to make parts for airplanes. And she did that because she wanted to know what it was like to actually work as a, a real worker or in that sort of thing. And from that, she was invited by a man called Bill Levitt to go to Chicago for the United Automobile Workers and to organize the crashes and um, the other childcare things that were needed for women during the war. And all of the things that she did was con were considered terribly subversive. Although today now we are totally accepted and it's part of life. Women are allowed to work and have childcare and things like that. So it was uh, she was unique in that respect. And it's a very big difference from working in her showroom, from running a business, as you said, and from working with, I guess, who were her clients? Can you remember? Did she socialize with them? Did, were they coming to your house, or was it very much separate? Some were and some weren't. I mean, she went to Vassar. Her mother went to Vassar. Her mother was in the last graduating, the second graduating class of Vassar. So it was at that point unheard of, and she went to Vassar and met a lot of her friends. Harden, who financed the thing, who she w went to Paris with immediately after graduation, uh, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Roosevelts. Uh, some were personal friends. Eleanor Gimbel, whose family owned Gimbel Department Store, uh, remained a very loyal friend throughout the whole of her life. And it seems that, I, mean, I think she's such a fascinating character because there seem to be continual contradictions that she she seems to continually be seeking to find this almost utopian idea of, of creating dress um, which has a, a wider reach but then is, is sort of up against manufacturers who don't appreciate the fit in the fabric. <laughs> I mean, that's another area of absolute madness. Lizzie always believed that, that style should be available to everybody and it should be available at, a, at a, a low cost and everyone should dress well and be happy in their clothes. And on several occasions she involved herself with department stores for mass producing her designs. And there was always the conflict between the cost of making it and the quality of what came out the other end because I didn't realize it until I saw it but when when you make a thousand garments at a clip, you pile a thousand layers of clothing together and you cut it with a jigsaw. And therefore the whole thing shifts and moves and no one garment is exactly like the one below it. When it's handmade and bespoke, it's absolutely perfect. And therefore it's not, it's imperfect, and the sizes are imperfect, and also when you, they cut the material, they cut the material to maximize, so if there are collars to be taken out of one corner and a sleeve out of another, and the right sleeve may have a different part of the cloth than the other, so that the bias of the cloth on one sleeve is not the same, so the sleeves hang differently. Because the way a garment hangs is actually de designed on the actual, the way the fabric is cut to lay and, and the weave of the fabric. So if it's made handmade, it doesn't matter. You have yards of waste in it because it's got to be perfect. But I mean, you wouldn't notice it particularly, this sleeve is probably made from a different part of the cloth than that one. And for a made to wear clothes, it's quite useful. In reality, in six months, if I wear it regularly, it, will fall, it won't fall apart, it'll change shape and cease to be what it should have been. And that kind of thing was a thing that she always fell foul with the, uh, of the mass-produced market with that, although they loved her stuff. And hats and handbags and things like that, which they couldn't do that because they had to be man-made, did very well. And her clothes sold very well. But, but did she, um, I know she was, she was in the first group of designers promoted by Lord and Taylor as part of their American designers That's right. um, promotion scheme. And it seems that she was a little um, ambivalent about being involved in that. Was she, was she interested in what other designers were doing at the time? Because there are a number of designers who 
weren't as sort of controversial as her, but were experimenting with sports or experimenting with style rather than fashion. Did she ever wear anyone else's clothes? Did she talk about these women? Did she have any contact? Worth had a, uh, and she, I believe, were. I wouldn't say deep friends, but certainly uh, in contact with each other. And I, Worth uh, wrote me a very nice note when Lizzie died. Um, but I don't think, I think overall her real interest was in the designs of what was going on in the rest of the world. I mean, her trips to Russia, uh, she encountered Kandinsky in the modern art sense, and a lot of her clothes reflect mm -hmm. that very flat palette, square form uh, of thing that Kandinsky was doing in art at the time. Uh, she was a great friend of uh, Noguchi, and she, Japanese things, or slight Japanese touches entered into her work. She was also a friend of Juan Miro, and Miro, uh, you know, is also reflected as Kandinsky in the nature of the work, in the shape of the cuts, you know, all those odd things that Miro did with moon, what aren't moons but look like moons and squares and things like that, are all hidden away in the design and affected by the design. That's really interesting because when I, I've been looking through. Um, her work that's kept in American collections. And I think it, it's really interesting what you're saying because they're often her day dresses of one color, but then there will be circles, triangles. Yes, and it would be, absolutely, color. and there will be a circle or a triangle and it will be, in a linen skirt, it will be a piece of leather. It will be a, a piece of metallic cloth it will be a bright orange spot. Uh, she also, I mean, there's another quite funny story who will be, remain nameless. She did a piece of knitwear for one of her shows, which was a, red, a yellow and black stripe, round striped dress, which looked very good on a slim lady. And one of her clients insisted that he, she had one, and this was a small, lady who was rather rotund and Lizzie insisted that if she had it she'd look like a bumblebee and the woman persisted and Lizzie said no look I'll redesign I'll design it so the stripes go up and down otherwise it won't work and the person insisted she paid for it it was made and she never wore it because she looked like a bumblebee <laughs> and paid no attention to what was the reality of what was so and in that sense of we're skipping about, but in design of clothes, her one of her first, her first husband, in fact, was a sculptor in Bennington, and he is the one that introduced her and showed her how, through sculpture, the flow of cloth and the flow of body movement and the body under the cloth affects what is on top of the cloth. I mean, these the, the trouser suits which Lizzie made in the 20s uh, for ladies when ladies didn't wear trouser suits, where you seem just above the backside just a little bit because it accents the shape of the bottom, is a thing that she took from Je Ralph Jester, which is, that's, you know, that's where you get the interest without being overtly unpleasant about it but and now all the stars run around with you know not a you know the thing draped over the back of their their ass to look really attractive that's so interesting because if you think of some of the other things you told me it's 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 kind of collection it's it's almost like a collage of influences which are all pointing in the same direction isn't it because um, you've talked about her grandmother bringing a seamstress who was fitting to each family member's individual body so that consciousness as an introduction to dress, as it were, mm -hmm. of body and fabric as one. Well. In Paris, she is very much an amateur Madeleine Violet, who draped on the body, was influenced by sculpture, was thinking about parts of the body, like the small of the back, which are sensual, but which aren't usually focused on by designers. And then you know, her husband, looking at um, Noguchi, looking at sculpture, and thinking about cloth and different textures and surfaces. 
together, and you can you can see how it's kind of building and nuancing her understanding of dress. Yeah, I, it's it's almost it's sort of it, it it's organic. It came out of, but it also I think it, it came out of a, her background in a sense. And I'll bring this in. I mean, her my family, her family are original Americans in a white sense that they, they came in 1628 to America and Henry Adams and his eight sons and who among who are endless senators and presidents are the ancestors and they were brewers and they were all sorts of things and they built New England and they were not political in the strict sense except they were very influential in, in the formation of the American, early American culture. And subsequently, uh, her mother, who was a conservative Republican, turned Democrat uh, because she was very socially minded and worked in the town that she worked in and saw the effect of the depression on the poor of the town. And she worked for uh, WPA and she worked for all these things as a person who dedicated to society. And I think as Lizzie would have been growing up in, you know, just post the First World War and into the Depression, she, uh, she was affected by that. And I think that the background affected her, her being. Um, she also went to Paris, when she went to Paris immediately out of graduating from Vassar, and she went to work for a copy shop uh, and because she was an American, she was acceptable to go into the the shows. And she would go into the shows, she would copy the show, come back and draw the designs, and the copy house would make uh, the, the same garment up, or a copy of the garment, almost within the same time frame as it was done, uh, being done by the real house. And the effect of that was that she learned really how dresses were put together and made and what you could do with and what you could do without. I mean, when I was, one of my small memories is learning how to iron. Yes. And we, we I mean, that there were, everything always had to be ironed all the time. And if you're a small person waiting around in the back of a fashion show with people throwing clothes around and getting dressed and buttons popping and all sorts of things like that, and things always, so I, you know, at about five was given the job of sort of ironing bits and pieces just to keep me amused. I wasn't, but what I, what she said is, look, just iron the bits that show, right? You know, the front of that shirt's perfect. Forget the back, forget the sleeves, do the cuffs, put the jacket on and get her out the door. And that kind of actual observation of the effect of what you're going to do. All right, the garment was handmade from top to bottom, but it was linen and it creased if you looked at it. So you actually had to, you know, do it, get it properly. And that was, you know, those sort of attention to detail, tying the things together, which then comes out in understanding how people work and how it functions. She was commissioned by the US military to design a nurse's uniform. And she looked at the nurses and their jobs and what had to be done and everything else. And she designed a uniform which was had a skirt and it also had trousers. It had a, an apron which was an integral part of the design so that you could be dressed in your uniform, wear an apron, take it off and protect your clothes underneath. It was designed with sleeves which were cut long so that you could have mobility and cut wide across the back with a pleat so you could move forward to enhance the nurse's ability to do it. The army looked at it and said it didn't look like a uniform. Today, now, they are using almost exactly the same garment. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, no, it really is. It's really... It's such a sort of lesson, and it's in in the way in which clothing actually works on the body versus a kind of fantasy of, of, of fashion as, as a sort of 2D drawing. Did she, do you remember seeing her draping on? To, did she drape on live models when she was creating a design? Did she use a mannequin? <laughs> she, she had a, a miniature mannequin and it used to travel about with her. 
And uh, so if we went to my grandmother's house or we went down to the Jersey Shore or we were at home, this sort of quarter-sized mannequin, which she used to actually make a sort of maquette of the design and to figure out how it was going to go. And the mannequin actually was the same shape in miniature as the big one. So that what she did with darts and pulling it in and changing it, she was able to do, you know, on the miniature and then do it. And because she said it was such an enormous waste of material to experiment, you know, you take a piece of silk and you chop it up and then you hang it and it doesn't work, you've cut it in the wrong place, you put it back another way. I mean, I can remember her with mouthfuls of pins going like this and trying to do this sort of thing. Uh, and sitting there with, 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 with Zyre watching her do this and wondering what, you know, what the hell was really going on. And then some, you know, six, three months later, whatever, you, it would appear, this miniature person would appear on a real person over here in another, in another way. So it's, uh, it was fascinating to live with it. And was that, was that her um, sort of design process for a collection? Were you aware of her doing other kinds of research um, for a particular collection or a particular garden? <laughs> yeah, I mean, she, her research for a collection uh, just went on all the time. It was about, first of all, what things find something that will go with something that will work together to go with it to work. She had this thing which she was fascinated by was the sort of almost astro astrological kind of belief that colors, people have a color, not a color red, blue, or green, but a color palette, a tone of a color. And therefore, if you set the tone, you could set the color tone of a collection for the kind of person you wish to attract to it, or you could dress somebody in a tone which would make them feel happy that they were in it, or sad if they were in it. And it seems to have worked. I mean, people uh, who had her clothes thought they were wonderful, and the people who wore them always seemed to be complimented on them, so it seemed to work. Uh, and she carried this through all the way through uh, into the housing, into the house design and painting, into, into the things she did. I mean, people like Miro uh, were experimenting with that kind of influence, but you have to look quite carefully at, at the work to see the variation in the colors. You know, a Miro to an untrained eye will look like six orange splots. But if you look at the six orange spots and he's taking time with it, you'll see that there's six different orange spots or not, depending on what he desired. And do you think, did, did your mother get those ideas about color from Miro? Uh, the underlying theory comes from a psychologist some way back in time, and I don't know its, I mean, I could, don't know its, remember its origins, but I think that her, fascinating fascination with that and her friendship with all these different people like Lurisa working in tapestry in various kinds of materials to make tapestry and things like that and uh, they influenced, inter-influenced each other I would say because they all had an intellectual excitement about things that were going to be different, that were going to, to have effect, that were going to communicate what was felt that were necessary to communicate. So it's, it's, again, it's a kind of collaging together of influences and these sort of different people, these different theories which are looking at sort of colour and form. And as I understand it, it it's sort of colour at different times in the day might affect you differently as well. And when you look at, yes, when you look at her dresses, you can see that coming through very much. She loved to name her clothes, by the way. They're, they're hilarious. <laughs> yes, they're just... And I love it because um, Lucille is a British couturier who also worked in the States. She did that in the sort of teens and sort of all in her era and just after. And hers are always very kind of chiffon names, like love lost and you know, just waiting for this. <laughs> and I love it that, that your mother's a much more like alimony. You know, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a there is a there's a handbag which goes 
with alimony, which I have the only existing of, which actually is in black suede with a piece of long wood, two little black suede bags, and it's actually a, a, a cock and balls. <laughs> and it's hysterical. <laughs> I've preserved it forever. <laughs> Sorry? I think they have the alimony dress. They have the dress, yes, yeah, so they don't have. I mean, I don't think they've got the bag. I, I've got the original bag. That's. I mean, there's one from 1937, there's a dress from 1937 called the Tarts dress, yeah. which has arrows pointing at the bust on the bottom. But again, they're very. It's very witty, but it's very sharp. Yes. The way that it's done. But she, I mean, she, her knitwear, when she really got cross with people, she used to knit numbers onto them. And one of them, if you put the numbers in, it said, fuck you, on, on it, because she was so angry with the people she was having to make it, <laughs> that she did it. And you know, it's very iconoclastic. It really is. And did you, did she? Because she also, in her writing, she obviously expands on and develops those ideas. So we've got the kind of the visual and material version of her ideas in her dress. We've then got the names of the dresses, which are adding another there. But then the fact that she writes as well is such a, I mean, it's such an amazing thing for a designer. It's such an interesting thing. But it's also fantastic for the dress historian because it's that expansion of her ideas that's so fascinating. Well, it's, it's a whole, I mean, it was about a whole life uh, in, in that sense. And her relationship with people w was always very passionate and quite, yeah, uh, and forceful. It was determining to get something out. And I think that fashion, house design, architecture, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, fascinated her as an architect. And she was, fascinated and very critical of it because she felt that certain aspects of it were cold and didn't work, whereas she loved glass and windows and views and things like that. So her thing was about a whole life. And what is sad for me is that if she had occurred post-war, she would have had all the accoutrements of managers and business managers and people to protect her and all sorts of things like that. And I think that she probably would have been important enough to not have been interfered with by people of, uh, who don't agree with, you know, liberal uh, thinking. And you know, that's a whole other political discussion about how you manipulate political thinking. Um, and certainly there are a number of instances where people's lives have been destroyed, creative lives have been destroyed for no more reason that the people who can do the destruction don't like what they are. And that's just, it's very sad. No, it's, it's terribly sad. I mean, perhaps if we come back to her politics in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, because it kind of links to that, about her work with your father and her, her work for sort of theatre. Because she worked for more uh, sort of individual um, actresses like Lynn Fontaine earlier, but then she did, I understand, do some costumes for your father's production as well. So uh, in the 30s? In the 30s, yes. Uh, uh, let's see how it goes. She dressed a number of very important people. She dressed Hep uh, Audrey Hepburn for. I think it was the moon is blue in no, Catherine what? Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. No, Audrey, Audrey Hepburn Audrey. was married to Mel Ferrer, oh. and Mel Ferrer was a great friend of my mother's. I see. And uh, I think she did some of the designs for, for uh, made the clothes for, for that particular show. Uh, she wanted to break into Hollywood, but she never did break into Hollywood. I think she did some of the costumes for some of Joe's earlier plays, uh, like Good Old Boys, uh, which had Sidley Nemet in it as a young child actor, and uh, things like that, because it was the edge of the federal theater. Uh, I mean, this is all American sort of uh, liberal thinking. The federal theater, the PM, the newspaper she wrote for, all these people were trying to, to bring American society forward. 
I was thinking, and New York and was the hub of all that at that particular time. But I don't recall her doing any of the later work, post-war work, because my relationship with my father, which was the sort of ongoing passion that moved from country to country and place to place, went on for a number of years. But when my father uh, was offered work in Hollywood, uh, and they, they were sort of living apart together in their own lives, and he went off to Hollywood in 43, 44, um, and then was subsequently drafted into the army <laughs> and did some military service and then came out. But at that point, their lives became very separate. So I don't think there's any post-war work in film. Did, because um, obviously your mother also, I, I think in the late 30s, she did a show that was all men's work, where she collaborated with a, a New York tailor. And she also was very passionate at sort of seeing men as, as needing liberation just as much as women needed liberation and that they should dress more <laughs> black women. Did. And I, I read, I was reading about your father and him um, sort of saying he was interested in clothes but didn't take that line. Did she influence you at all? Did she talk to you about any of these ideas when you were growing up? Of how you should dress, how you should think about yourself? Uh. I think it, yes and no. I mean, as a, a, a small person, uh, I tended to be turned out the most outla outlandish bits of clothing. And I have to admit that I found it extremely embarrassing because I didn't, it, you know, I wasn't a member of the circus. And therefore, to go out in public looking like little Lord Fauntleroy was what kind of. What kind of things can you describe? This is 40s. I mean, things like short trousers and caps and jackets and things like that. Uh, not, you know, only once or twice did she tr try it because she saw that it distressed me. I, I came to it subsequently, I think. I mean, my father, who later in his life uh, became exceedingly well-tailored and looked after and had clothes made for him which were extremely well-made. Uh, and things like knowing enough about costume, about clothes. You know, you have your jackets made by Schiffinelli in Rome, but uh, you, Dougie, uh, whatever his name, Major, uh, makes your trousers because the Italians make the trousers too tight and they don't look good. So you, and you know, and then you insist that the Italians don't like it, but they put a red lining in it and this sort of thing. So he learned all that from Lizzie in terms of diversity. I think they all in that particular area fed on each other in an intellectual and emotional sense to try and move design, fashion, style, movie forward uh, into, into different areas of, uh, of life. I mean, the banality of Hollywood musicals in the 50s reflects its fear uh, of trying to do something that was more dynamic and yet running concurrently in the B-movie area of that, a lot of very strong films were made of, with very interesting content and of some kind of social meaning, and I don't mean that in the worst sense, but I mean in the best sense, things that people could look at and understand. So uh, I think they influenced each other a great deal. But I was, I was interested, I was reading, um, when I was reading about him, someone described his work in the 30s, they were talking about his work in the 30s, and they described it, I think, as a marriage of modernism and Marxism. And I thought, it, not necessarily Marxism, but I think it's interesting to think of, of your mother's work in terms of, sort of modernism and, and politics, as it were. To sort of think about the way, as you say, that she's thinking about colour and form, of thinking of almost like the purest form of design of, of, of fashion, of, mm -hmm. of body and fabric, and how you can achieve something with longevity. So as you say, it's, style, it's about style rather than trends and you know, things which can be very ephemeral. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure that that's a question because I don't know how to, I don't know how to answer that. I'm not quite sure how to answer it. I mean, they, yes, look, 
the concept of, uh, uh, of dialectic, of uh, all those things which are, you know, Hegelian Marxist ideas were very much running through the thought processes of my early life. Uh, a lot of them were subsequently uh, not discredited, but moved on. It's like, you know, Einstein invents the theory of relativity, and everyone goes, poo poo, it's no good, it doesn't work. And then 40 years later, they say, ah, oh, that was a great building block to where we've come to, and the social content of the world, we haven't found an answer. Either, you know, the Russian communist experiment, which when my mother talked about Russia, she said it was the most amazing place to go to because it was so backward that it was worse than the Deep South, and yet so advanced in its thinking and its art and its music that it was like nowhere else on earth. And the thing was, in an intellectual sense, completely contradictory. I don't think she was aware of the overweening view of the, you know, the communist control of the whole of society and things like that because she was invited to show her clothes in Russia. Uh, looked at it at a distance, you could say it was a propaganda stunt. On the other hand, she learned a great deal by going to Russia and looking at artists and talking to people and being able to go into that society. So. Uh, she was also, interestingly enough, the first woman ever to show American clothes in Paris as a separate uh, thing. And that was a willful publicity stunt. On the other hand, it worked extremely well because it made her reputation. And uh, she, w she was very much aware of publicity and how it affected things. And that's why I think in today's world she would have fared much better than she did in the world that she lived in. because. As the idea shifted, there was no communication like the net or anything like that to let people know that the ideas were shifting. So suddenly, her at the end of the war, everybody wanted to be Miss America, the GIs were coming home, we're going back to a conservative period of where we existed, and she was out there you know, in the left field, uh, wanting to throw away bras and wanting to, you know, her dialogues on women's underclothes are absolutely hysterical and the family gatherings around where, you know, people would be wearing, it have a, a side. Thanksgiving at my grandmother's house, 28 people sit down to, to have Thanksgiving dinner. One side of the family are, is the family of General Patton, and arch American one thing. And the other side of the family is my Aunt Charlotte, my, who is a, a journalist, the first woman ever to appear presenting on American television, home economics. Her sister, my mother, her younger sister, who's the head of statistics for the Bureau of Census. And the patents are all going like this in their girdles, and my mother is <laughs> sending them up rotten <laughs> because they're so uncomfortable. And this leads to, a, you know, the usual family feud of, you know, what happens when everybody gets a little over-refreshed at the end of the evening. <laughs> but uh, she, you know, she did believe in, in, like men's, we start on men's suits. She thought that suits actually constricted men in their freedom to do things. And she saw no reason why men shouldn't be well-dressed, but not have to be buttoned up. And this was one of her great arguments. It was a thousand years ahead of its time. You know, before Klein, before any of those people, uh, she felt that, the, you know, free clothes were there. And she also felt you could be well-dressed. You know, if you wanted to have a dinner jacket, you should have a dinner jacket. But the dinner jacket should be an expression of something, not a reproduction of a, of a uniform. And, and, and again, that comes back to those early experiences of having clothing made in you. And, it, and it's so hard, and I suppose that was one of her issues, of translating that onto a wider scene. It, it, of, of translating the concern for the wearer and what the wearer is like, how the wearer feels in his or her clothes, into something that's mass produced or even produced on a smaller scale, could be 
really difficult. And it seems like that comes through in a lot of her writing, um, where she's talking about the way the relationship between wearer and the sort of psychology of the wearer and their clothing. And again, is that something that influenced you? Did you read her books as they came out? Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I have two complete sets of them, which I've gathered over time, and I've read them. I, they're really, they're, they're fascinating in the sense that they're really written from the heart. Uh, they're not works of literature, but they are an expression of time, of the time that they were written in and the attitudes that come in. There's an awful lot to be gleaned from them for the modern reader. A great deal of what was expressed in those times has moved on. We have moved on. But fundamentally, the male chauvinist position in the power base in the world remains the same. It changes slightly, but in, certainly in the Western world, we've moved forward a fair amount, not a great deal. We still have, you know, if Mrs. Clinton becomes the president, we may have done some things, but I don't know whether that will happen. We may get Donald Trump, in which case the entire world will fall apart. And we can, have, you know, that, but that, leaving that aside, that's opinion. The, the changes which are taking place around us are still, I think, governed by the things which have not been mediated. Lizzie was again. The idea you have to make things pay for themselves in order to make them. The idea that you have to make more money than God doing it, uh, she found actually quite abhorrent. Although she was a businesswoman and she ran her shop like a business, but she didn't feel that she had to walk away from everything being a multimillionaire. Uh, and that was one of the arguments she had with the other thing, that the, the level of profit that drives has become, become moved from profit to greed. And she was very much uh, opposed to that, uh, which was very uh, anti-society at the time, at the end of the war. Um, I think it's becoming now quite apparent that we are in a situation where greed is d doing a lot of damage. Um, her books are, 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 are probably somewhat outdated, although some of the things that exist within them are views of a society that we, you know, we don't really re relate to. Uh, I mean, I do barely because I was, a, I'm a pre-war person, but a lot of people have forgotten the war and those things. I mean, men can take it, why women cry. All those things are very specific to a time, to, you know, to the needs of the people who are working during the war, to, to men being dressed in suits and abused by the society. and. It, it's a, it's a, she was a remarkable woman. Uh, there is a co coincidentally a, a, a thing that relates, and maybe we need to. We're coming to the end of this, but in my father's work, my father became absolutely fascinated uh, with how you create modernism in film. If you're going to use the literary term of modernism, uh, and his films his later films, particularly the Pinter ones, are related to creating characters out of space. An empty space create, is a character within the drama of the whole thing. And I think that Lizzie and he were both, in that sense, looking, looking at that uh, as part of life. I don't see it as a particularly Marxist view because it's in a way anti-Marxist. Uh, but on the other hand, um, Joe, like Lizzie in a sense, never quite achieved what he wanted to because the picture that would have fulfilled everything that he was trying to express philosophically, and I think as an extension of what Lizzie was doing, was the screenplay that Pinter wrote uh, about Proust, based uh, on Proust, and it's an amazing screenplay, but it's totally uncommercial. I mean, you could, it, I don't think it would become a work of art, you know, a multi-million dollar work of art, but it would have, I think, enabled people to see exactly what was driving color and space and time and thought 
It would have encapsulated in film terms what Lizzie was trying to encapsulate in, in, in design, in, in fashion and design. Could you tell us about the later years of your mother's life and what's your sense of her during the 60s? Was she still engaged with thinking about politics and dress at that time? Uh, yeah, uh, she was engaged, but the, the outside world was not engaging with her. Um, she was very badly damaged by the, the closure of the shop, and she didn't actually realize why. And nobody realized why until many years later when files and things became available from public records uh, that a... The, the idea of the destructive power of the secret services and getting into organizations and, and fermenting problems for the people they don't like, that kind of governmental activity did not become public until fairly recently, actually. I think we're looking at 50 years on that the public has, the files had to be made public. Uh, so she never understood why, why everything changed. I think part of it was the world changed and the communications uh, on how it was changing were not as instant as they are now. I mean, you can go online now and see how the world changes hourly. Uh, I'm not sure if it's good or not, but it's fascinating. Um, and I think that she, her later years were rather, were rather sad. I mean, she tried to write a book, several books, which didn't quite work. Uh, she was maintained largely by a great friend of hers called Joseph Riznik, who is a rather interesting and fascinating man. His family made uniforms for the American army during the First and Second World War, and he was quietly very, very well off and looked after my mother in her later, later life. My own connection with her ends pretty well in 56. I have only saw her several times after that simply because I, when I finished high school in America, the, I was approached by uh, the Secret Service to divulge the people who were friends of my father's in, uh, during the period that he lived in, um, lived in Hollywood. Uh, and my father had come to Europe in 51 to, to avoid testifying in the McCarthy thing. And I, I had a summer job working for the telephone company, installing telephones. And I was invited to lunch by some gentleman, uh, namelessly possibly FBI, and told that if I wanted to keep my job in communications, I could if I would divulge and spy for them. And I... Uh, my father then invited me to come to England and go to university and within three weeks I'd left. It's quite, a, quite an emotional thing. Um, it's hard recalling this. Um, my, uh, so I left and I came to England in 56 and I literally had to start from scratch because I had no, my university entrance was not acceptable here. So I didn't see my mother again until 63. I saw her briefly in California. And then again in uh, 68. And those are the only two times during that period that I actually saw her. We had a certain amount of communication by mail. We didn't have email and things like that. Uh, but I personally feel that, you know, she felt that she never actually achieved, and I don't mean achieved in terms of success or recognition, but was able to communicate successfully what she was trying to, to put to the, the outside world. Um, and similarly with my father, I think that his work in terms of his intellectual film work uh, was never completed because the last film was never made. And uh, therefore, for me, there's a certain amount of sadness. Um, and you, you mentioned
mentioned your Sorry? Mo- you mentioned to me your mother um, when she was in the Chelsea Hotel that she still had. Yeah. Some oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. When she died, the, I mean, it's a very conflicting series of events. I mean, my second son was born, and three days later, my mother died. Uh, so I had to, I felt I had to, I packed up and went to America for four days to, to clear up what was left and to, you know, register her death and do all those sort of things. And in the flat that she had in the Hotel Chelsea, there was a very weird collection of memorabilia, I would call it, as much as anything else. I mean, bits of silver from her first marriage to Ralph Jester. Uh, a piece of coat hanger sculpture made by Sandy Calder, which had a little luggage label on it saying chastity belt, which he'd given her as a birthday present in the 30s. Uh, A screen by Lursa, uh, an early Calder piece of sculpture, um, some pieces of clothing that she had made, and the, the, the cock and ball bag was there. Uh, and, but scraps of memorabilia, uh, nothing consistent. I suppose that she actually hung on to them as, as sort of remembrances of things past that didn't turn out quite the way they should have been. Um, no, it was, it, it, it was very strange, it was a very strange moment when she died. Uh, she developed a very serious alcohol problem for a number of years, but f- interestingly enough, she she was largely conquered it and come a- come away from it quite well. And uh, that is reflected in something which is that in the uh, Radcliffe University. Uh, Biographies of 100 Most Important Women in American History, done in 10-year tranches, she features. And they were not prepared to use the piece, which was written by a man called Patrick Mahoney, uh, because she died of alcoholism, they thought. And Patrick went back over the autopsy and discovered that she hadn't died of alcoholism. She'd actually died of a perforated ulcer. And then Radcliffe was prepared to print the thing. So that was, uh, you know, that was interesting. That kind of mm-hmm. attitude toward women by a th- woman's institution, which is supposed to, you know, reflect those sort of things, but they, they did uh, in the end print the thing, and that was, I found, rather pleasing. Oh, definitely. But a lot of research had to go in. We had to go back right into the, the death records and get them, because it went round and round and round, and I was uh, absolutely amazed that, that this sort of people who had or had mental or psychological or physical problems, I mean, you know, Edith Piaf, uh, Piaf killed herself. The, I don't mean Edith, I mean <laughs> Sylvia Plath killed yes. herself. Uh, she had a very serious mental problem. But it doesn't diminish the work. Mm-hmm. No, of course. And uh, I mean, it's so important, I think, that your mother's work is remembered and the range and depth of her work is remembered. Yeah, I'm not sure how, how you... It gets stored in a corner, how you bring it to the attention, because it is a piece, it's not a a whole in itself, it's a piece of a time and a piece of uh, an era, uh, which in many respects was one of the best in in American uh, history, in the the Roosevelt uh, uh, post-depression. uh, New New Deal thing brought America as a whole forward a great deal. I mean, it has it, things like the black pro the black problem, the uh, persecution of blacks. Those things are only now beginning to be resolved. The persecution of 
Indians and those sort of things. But with his, there is progress and the point about uh, the, the era of Lizzie and the people around her, many of them did things which, uh, you know, should be brought forward and being able to see, to reflect now on what they are, because I do think that historically, where we are now, we stand on a cusp of either real progress or real old-fashioned back to, you know, fascism at a level which was only just barely gone. And, uh, I mean, I'm expressing my own views now. It has very little to do with, with Lizzie, although it has a great deal to do with where I come from or where I am. Uh, you know, men in dresses, I think, may be a little extreme, but it's, uh, it's a nice idea. Well, and I think it's also the fact that she was willing to suggest that, that things can, can change and that she was seeking ways in which that can be done and that she saw dress as an integral part of that. And I think that's one of the big le legacies <laughs> of her work is that she, she recognizes fashion, well, dress is important and that even now people don't always do that. So I think, you know, she's incredibly important, you know, not to, to sort of dress history, to women's history and to American history, to thinking about the ways that one person can develop ideas, you know, even if, as you say, not they weren't all re realized, it doesn't matter, the process and the thinking is all there for us to look back on. And I think this interview has really opened up some of those ideas and opened up ways that we can think about them. So I think it's been You get the very vexed question about art. Yes. And creativity, and does society need it to function uh, within its own terms, whether, you know, do we, is culture part of the economic society in which we live in? I mean, the building we're sitting in, Mr. Courtauld spent a lot of his money to get his name on the building, and I think probably did believe that culture was an important part of existence. Uh, there's a very Philistine ele element uh, of the modern world which doesn't seem to recognize that or want to recognize that and how creativity evolves. Although there are many uh, things which are changing. The Los Angeles Film Festival, Short Film Festival, showed a pantheon of very interesting ideas recently uh, of short films made largely for no money but examining elements of society and life which are uh, very good, and I, it's quite a powerful uh, medium. Definitely, and I think I think maybe to sort of um, think about Lizzie as you, uh, your mother, sorry, as as you have talked of her in relation to her heritage, to that you know sort of founding fathers' mm. relationship. To think about how through that she was brought up to think about social welfare economy, but also dress as part of a whole, well, it's and how you dress live, isn't and it? art. And, uh, exactly, and it's, it's that thing that, you know, sadly she suffered in, because of her sort of political views and because of, and because of her views of how that links to dress, but I think that doesn't in any way diminish the importance of what she was doing. It, it sort of contributes to, um, you know, the reasons why we should look at her work and we should think about all these ideas that you've been talking about today. Well, I, you know, I have to concur with you, but I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, Do you have anything else we could discuss before um, we part? No, I think that was it, so thank you okay. so, Listen, so thank much. you very much. I it's hope this is of interest to someone in history. I'm sure it's of interest to lots of people, so thank you so much, Gabriel. You're welcome. Thank you. Push the button. Cut me off. <laughs> <laughs>